Shannon, let's bring you in. Um, and uh, to throw around another stat there, 50, according to the World Bank, 50 million children in Africa do not have access to education, to schools. Um, and I hope your website is correct because you seem to be growing so fast, the numbers could be outdated. What I've got is that right now you have 400 schools across Africa servicing some 100,000 students. You're wanting to grow, and it's a very, very ambitious target by 2025 to educating, and this is in the, the primary and pre-primary uh, space, one million children in developing economies. So not exclusively in Africa, but also in Asia. Is your website up to date? And uh, my second question is that you present a very good model of blended finance, and I'm going to allow you to explain exactly what that is. Well, our website's close to up to date. Uh, 461 uh, open nursery schools and primary schools across both East and West Africa. Uh, we, we began in Kenya, expanded to Uganda, Nigeria, and very shortly in Andhra Pradesh in India. Our focus, as you said, is to serve uh, children with truly high quality education, wherever that might be needed. And over the years that we've been doing this, looking at different finance models has been incredibly important, both to enable us to scale, to do the investments that we need in technology-enabled services and teacher support methods, as well as working with different nations and the different syllabi. So we've had an opportunity to work in what's now being called blended finance, you know, where you're able to access some amount of concessional capital that takes a different that allows risk to be distributed in a more appropriate way between different financial partners. And so in our first experience with that, we were being asked um, by DFID, which was looking at how to improve education outcomes across Nigeria, where they've had a long focus as a development finance institution. But at the time, it was a very risky place to enter. They were looking for various innovative business models who would come in and work hand in hand with the government, but work as a private sector ent entity opening up new nursery and primary schools and really trying to push the market to increase the quality of provision as well as increase access. So they were, um, they put out a bid, people applied. Uh, we were able to succeed against that bid and to secure an, a bit of concessional capital, which enabled us to later on crowd in private investment. Whereas as we were moving into, at the time it was 2014, it was before the most recent election, there was a lot of instability around the currency. It wasn't a time where a significant commercial capital was ready to look So break at. down concessional capital for the audience. So concessional capital simply um, is capital that is uh, a grant to-, to Philanthropic be, capital. Philanthropic, it's, it's not debt, it's not paid back. It enables usually a very specific development goal to happen. You could think of it as, uh, you know, for, for decades there's been capital that helps support um, work in the sector, whether it's in health or education or infrastructure, which is not structured as debt or equity, but is philanthropic. It is a grant to the government or an institution to operate. And in this case, given our proven development outcomes, you know, that we're a private operating partner, but we have proven development outcomes for children in nursery and primary school, showing how that they can learn more compared to what else is happening in the neighborhood. And so that was very attractive to a development finance institution that's looking for measured outcomes. You know, as we move more and more to talking about pay for success, um, pay for results, uh, even looking towards new, relatively new financial instruments like a development impact bond, that operating entities that can prove delivery of service and are happy to be measured by it, whether it's in health, education, agriculture, that these are, are sectors particularly in Africa and the emerging markets that need more capital crowded into them. Commercial capital has a different risk profile. It also- We're gonna go into those details. So Shannon, I also want to commend you on the fact that your schools don't have electricity and that you are re you're utilizing regional uh, town resources, I'm assuming, whether it's solar or renewable. So let's hand it to you to give us your thoughts on the topic at hand. Thank you, Bronwyn. It's really important to think about crowding in investment. So I know that we spoke a bit about blend in finance, how you could get philanthropic capital to take a different risk profile than commercial capital and try to combine them. We've also had experience in working with IFC and seeing what the IFC can do as a lead financer across Africa. 
many venture capitalists and private equity firms are relatively new to the space. They're interested, they see possibility, they're looking for deal flow, but many of them don't have decades of deep due diligence on the markets, on the capital markets, the regulatory markets, or on these operating entities. So in our experience, in our last round, which was led by the IFC, it was the very in-depth due diligence the IFC did that then enabled the CDC and other DFI out of the UK to follow on, but then gave confidence to commercial investors because they were able to then see the work that IFC had done. And so when you have those types of co-financing, you, you, you have entities that have strong relationships on the ground able to find the entities that are worth investing in that could contribute to both physical and social infrastructure going forward. And I think it's really important that you know, we think uh, strategically and creatively about how to distribute risk and that that will crowd in more commercial capital. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.